So our, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Wolfgang Baer, and he is our, uh, he's a professor here, but he's also director of research here at Moran Eye Center. And so it's a pleasure to have you talk, and he's going to update us on some of the important research that he's doing. So, we change uh, topics quite a bit. I'm a biochemist, molecular biologist, and I think I was invited to present here because I do something translational. Um, my topic is uh, celiopathies, and I, my protein or my gene is called IQCD1 or MPHP5. Sounds very complicated. It stands for IQ domain containing protein B1 or nephrocystin 5. This protein, when mutated, causes senior local syndrome in patients, in human patients, and we are producing mouse models to replicate or see differences in mouse in mutant mice with mutations in the same gene. So senior local syndrome is an autosomal recessive disorder characterized by <coughs> nephronophthesis and progressive retinal degeneration. The worldwide uh, prevalence is estimated to be one in a million, so it's relatively rare. The, the disease was discovered <coughs> like more than 50 years ago in papers published in 1961 by Dr. Senior and Dr. Loken, who gave them the name of the senior local syndrome. There are only six genes involved in senior local syndrome. They're called MPHP1, 4, 5, 6, and 10. One is still unknown. And <clears throat> I have two students working on those genes. One is Christian Hanke Gokokia, a student, a graduate student from Germany, and Michelle Reed, a graduate student of the neuroscience program at the University of, Reed of Utah. Nico was an empty PhD student in my lab starting the project several years ago. So what is senior Hogan syndrome? In human patients, you see diffuse interstitial cell infiltration with fibrosis, tubular atrophy, <coughs> cyst formation, and end-stage kidney disease is this one at 13 years of age. In mice, you see mutant kidneys become smaller, shown here. The, the, the medulla is reduced, and cyst formation can also be seen. So it's uh, a, a mouse nephronophthesis, not generated by one of my favorite genes. It's another gene which does not cause retinal degeneration, just nephronophthesis. So the <coughs> eye disease is retinitis pigmentosa, or LCA, labor congenital amaurosis. And uh, it's pretty well known to most of you, uh, compromised peripheral vision, tunnel vision, abnormalities in RPE and cones, and eventual late in life blindness. So I just I made this picture to show you the complexity of the uh, nephron of T uh, nephrocystine uh, genes going from 1 to 19, and all those different colors are different domains in proteins, and you see there's virtually no relationship among all of those proteins. There's no sequence similarity, and the function of all of those proteins is unknown. The proteins causing the form of causing senior local systems are in yellow, and the other proteins, the other mutations in those genes cause <coughs> Meckel syndrome, Bartos Beetle syndrome, and Schubert syndrome, which are uh, ciliopathies, syndromic ciliopathies. So I'll just give you a very short introduction to the photoreceptor nomenclature so we are all on the same page in the, in the rest of my presentation. Our photoreceptors are having outer segments and inner segments. They are connected by what was previously called a connecting cilium and is now named a transition zone. The transition zone between inner and outer segments. And you see uh, there are lots of disks containing the photodensuction cascade. There's an axoneme, which is basically the, back the backbone of the outer segment. And uh, I made an enlargement of 
the axoneme to give you all the nomenclature we use in the, in the next few slides. The axoneme is a, a singlet microtubule arrangement. The transition zone is a doublet microtubule. And there's a basal body, which is one of two centrioles in the cell. The basal body, which is important for generating transition zone and axoneme. And then there's a daughter centriole. <coughs> so, also important is photoreceptor autosegment development after birth, at birth from birth to about three weeks of age. You see that at uh, the neonatal mouse, the basal body conducts <coughs> to, the, to the cortex of the cell. And at uh, P3, it pushes a little bit of a membranous bubble here, which will be the transition zone shown here, and eventually you form an axoneme shown in blue. So this takes about three weeks from birth in mouse, and uh, we are mostly interested in mutations that change this arrangement or prevent or the segment formation. So the basal body, as I said, is very important. Basal body and axoneme are very important for the outer segment scaffolding. Without them, the outer segment would be very instable. <clears throat> so this shows you a thing from an, from an independent paper. Shows you that all those nephrocystins are closely uh, are connected, uh, either directly or indirectly, forming a, an elaborate network in the proximal cilia. This would be the basal body transition zone uh, in bursting compartment and the axony. So now we get to my protein, and you see uh, it has several domains. One is called an IQ motif, which is a thermodynamic binding site. The CC is a cold coil region for protein interaction, and uh, ACCP is, is a uh, site for interaction with another nephrocystine. So multiple null mutations are associated with senior, senior local syndrome, as shown here. Uh, throughout the, the, the molecule. So what, since the uh, disease is recessive, we were planning to make a knockout mouse. And for a knockout mouse, we would insert a gene trap in one of the introns. The gene trap basically prevents translation of the molecule, shown here. So it stops right where the gene trap is. The functional protein cannot be made and evidence that we have knocked out the gene is shown here. In the control, you see the nephrocystin 5 accumulating at the transition zone, and in the knockout mouse, the protein is absent. So to uh, electroretinography at P14, when mouse eyes are opening, you see that the mouse is blind, there's no response, same at P18. This is scotopic for rods and photopic for cones, Again, the cones are not active, and the mouse basically is blind at birth. OCT can be used to look directly at retina, and you see that in the knockout mouse at P28, one month of age, we see a LC8 type or retinitis pigmentosa type phenotype with degeneration of rods. <clears throat> now, this gives you an idea how rhodopsin is and how other segments are developing with rhodopsin as a marker. Rhodopsin is the visual pigment in the photoreceptor outer segments. At P6 and P10, which is before eye opening, you see slowly developing outer segments. And after eye opening at P15, uh, rhodopsin and outer segments are forming uh, are very strong. In the knockout, in contrast, you see no outer segments developing. Rhodopsin mislocalizing in the inner segments and eventually a rapid degeneration and you see essentially one row of nuclei, of nuclei still present at P30, which most likely is uh, cones only. <clears throat> so degeneration can be ass assessed by looking at the thickness of an outer nuclear layer, which is only the photoreceptors, and you see there is a relatively little degeneration in the first two weeks of age, but after eye opening at P14, there's a rapid degeneration in one month. The degeneration is mostly complete. So to our surprise, <coughs> kidneys were completely normal. This is a kidney section at one, at one year of age. 
is a control and a knockout, you see there is no difference. So mutant kidneys are completely normal. This was assessed by Dr. Patricia Rivello at the ARUP here at the University of Utah. And so there's no nephronophthesis in our mouse model. So it is not a, it is not a symptomic celiopathy, it's just a, a non-symptomic celiopathy affecting only eyes. And uh, kidney cilia, as you see here, are completely normal in the mutant mouse. So cilia in kidneys are not affected, explaining why we don't have a nephronophthesis. And uh, this is a picture of mouse embryon fibroblasts. And uh, these are very important for development uh, during, embryonic, uh, uh, di during embryonic development. And you see they have cilia in the controls and they have cilia in the knockout basically unchanged, consisting of basal body, daughter centriol, and cilium. If this cilium would not be formed in the control, the mouse probably would not survive and would be embryonic lethal. So this is a reason why we have live mice. Now, looking at uh, mechanisms, why do we have a degeneration? We decided to do frozen sections and assay the, ret the retina. And you see a frozen section here, O and L, inner segment, the transition zone, and the outer segment, the base of the, the proximal part of the outer segment. And you see something green in here. This is mar a marker EGFP sent in two calcium binding proteins interacting very strongly with, with the transition zone and, and centrioles. So to close it up, we made an enlargement, and you see uh, a transition zone is formed. Here is the basal body and the daughter centriole and these are other cells. In the knockout, we don't see, we see the basal body and the daughter centriole, but we don't see a transition zone explaining why we don't see an outer segment. And this is a second experiment with a protein called POM1. POMINIM1 is located at the base of an outer segment and is responsible for formation of discs. And you see in the knockout that this protein mislocalizes, it doesn't form a disc, um, a, a, a proximal disc, and again, consistent with lack of outer second formation. <clears throat> On an ultrastructural level, we confirm that the uh, control uh, retina forms, uh, here's the basal body, forms a very nice transition zone and a little bag of membranes which eventually develops into an outer segment. And in the control, in the, in the knockout, we see a basal body and a little bit of an extension which resembles a stunted transition zone, but it's not a normal transition zone. And at a later age, at P10, we see outer segment formation in the control, basal body transition zone, axonine, outer segment, and there is no outer segment in the NPHP5 knockout mouse. So what we have learned is NPHP5 knockout was made. The clinical phenotype is LCA, a non-symptomic celiopathy. Degeneration of mutant rod photoreceptors is complete at one month. Mutant kidneys do not develop nephronophthesis. Nodal cilia of embryonic fibroblasts are normal. Photoreceptor transition zones, axonemes, and outer segments are absent. So we would like to know more details about cones. Cones are important for daylight vision. If we can figure out a way to rescue cones in those mice, maybe vision can be restored. So <clears throat> the way to go for cones is to make a double knockout mouse with an NRL transcription factor. NRL is the neural retinal leucine zebra transcription factor. It is required for what development. If we get rid of this gene by a knockout, we would make a mouse that, has, that develops only cones. So that's, of course, a very nice experiment because in the wild-type mouse, we have only 3% cones and 97% rods. So we can now, with this mouse, focus on cones. And you see here a development of cones from P15 to 3 months in the control mouse. And you see again our centrioles and transition zone and the outer segment, the cone outer segment forming. And in the, on the NRL level and the ONL level, you see a beautiful Thick or another. This is only cones, not rods are eliminated. And in the control, you see our two centrioles, no uh, transition zone. And surprisingly, at three months, 
the is essentially no degeneration of the cones. So we have a stable situation of at least three months uh, where the co where cone degeneration is basically very, very slow. And we have a window of three months or longer for gene therapy, for gene th replacement therapy and rescue cones. Yeah, so it, this is shown here again, looking at RNL thickness, it doesn't change for a period of almost three months, not significantly at least. So, and these are uh, the <coughs> experiments to, to come up with a virus for gene replacement therapy. On the left is a vector for uh, transfection of tissue culture experiments, and this would be a shuttle vector for producing a virus that can be injected into the subretinal space, expressing nephrocystin 5 and hopefully initiating uh, cellular genesis and other segment formation and we have a window of six months to do this. So I mentioned at the beginning we are trying to do a similar set of experiments with MPHP10 and MPHP10 is known to cause senior local syndrome in human patients and so far we have produced a knockout and you see the knockout produces a bodied beetle syndrome like phenotype. It has six digits and uh, unfortunately the mouse does not survive. It's a neonatal mouse just born but not alive. So the future of those kind of experiments is to make a tissue spe a retina specific knockout and maybe design a second set of <coughs> gene replacement therapies with MPHP10 mice. So this is a summary slide. MPHP5 null alleles in human cause senior local syndrome. Null alleles in mouse affect only the retina. Kidneys are normal in the knockout and little rods degenerate within one month, but cones are very stable and survive up to three months or maybe possibly even six months allowing for gene therapy. Here's my thank you slide. Grants from, I have two or one grants from the National Institute. But not the uh, Research to Prevent Blindness has an unrestricted grant for the department. Foundation Finding Blindness and Retina Research Foundation <coughs> gave me small grants to support our um, graduate students. Thank you. Fascinating, and uh, it, it, indeed, if we could figure out how to decouple rod degeneration from cone, it would make that disease. Uh, I think the chances are very good. Easy. The chances are very good in mouse, but I can't guarantee it will work in humans the same way, because from mouse to human is a large step. We would include uh, a large animal model in between, maybe a dog model. There is a dog model for senior <coughs> locums in always and BHP5. So if we can do it in a dog model, and we have. Uh, with modifications of the shuttle vector and the and the virus, we may be able to get there. So, so I don't know if you mentioned, but everyone, uh, uh, Wolfgang's our director of research, uh, as well as uh, all of the other work that he's doing, and we're just very proud of the uh, outstanding work he has. And, and Nico, who he's talking about, is one of our residents. Where are you, Nico? Raise your hand. Nico here? I think he's on call. He's, he's on not on call. He said, so, uh, uh, he said he's on it call. It shows you how there's this interesting combination of uh, people working uh, together to do interesting things. I actually things. wanted Nico to present his but this time, but he said he's on call. So yeah. <laughs> well, that, we do that to our oh. beginning residents for sure. But anyway, it's very exciting. And, uh, you know, it's how you've gone through this and the potential to change uh, the cone side with uh, in retinitis pigmentosa is just a huge blessing. So your mouse model of MPH5 is mostly LCA type, but at least in humans, it's not quite that bad. Do you, how do you kind of re how do you reconcile that? Patients with senior locum, they tend to be more simple. You know, uh, differences from human to mouse are very common. I have many genes which cause LCA in human, and when knocked out, there is no phenotype in mouse. So, and there's a dog model with the same mutation, it's a frame shift mutation in NPHP5, and this dog has a late onset retinitis pigmentosa. So, so there is a, an axon informed, there's a transition zone in all this, and an outer segment, but then it degenerates. So, what came with the NPHP5 model, you said that it's 
Why do you think that that uh, gene is not required for kidney development, or do you think that there's another gene that rescues the phenotype? The short answer is redundancy of nephrocystins. Uh, redundancy, there are so many nephrocystins, and some of them can replace the function or substitute for the function that has been lost. So it's de really depending on the tissue and on the cilia in brain, kidney, liver, and blood marrow. So it's a different situation. So another possibility in human therapy would be to stimulate another one of those proteins that kind of possibly stimulate. if that if that would be a fantastic idea if that can be done yes. Well, thank you, Wolfgang, and thank you to all of our morning speakers. We'll break for lunch. Now.